So I'm happy to introduce Jeff Parker, George Hay, Professor of Economics Emeritus. Jeff taught at Reed from 1988 to 2021. He earned a PhD from Stanford University in 1981, specializing in macroeconomic analysis and econometrics. In addition to these fields, he regularly taught courses at Reed in monetary and fiscal policy and the economics of science and technology. During the 2000s, he co-taught a course called The Economics of Reed College, which discussed the literature on the economics of higher education using Reed as a semester long case study. He has done research on the economics of higher education, including studies of the enrollment demand at colleges, faculty salary policies, and most recently, how students' interactions with their peers affect their learning. More recently, he has explored the causes of differences in unemployment rates among subnational regions. He spent the fall of 2015 in Bratislava, Slovakia, doing research on regional unemployment and teaching macroeconomics at the University of Economics. His extracurricular interests include performing with the African Marimba Ensemble Muvuru, and he recently retired from refereeing amateur and high school soccer matches. So Jeff will discuss today pandemic and post-pandemic inflation. And with that, um, Jeff, thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Could everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I, I, I apologize if there's any background noise. The um, power company has been trimming trees across the street from our house. And so it may be that all of a sudden we get uh, wood chipper sounds in the background. I will hope not. Um, so thank you for being here today. I have to say it's uh, it's a little intimidating. Uh, it's my first time in front of a, uh, um, a Zoom audience since I retired uh, last spring uh, after having spent my last two and a half semesters teaching from this chair, uh, which was uh, kind of an also a, a different experience. Um, but that's a, that's another story, and and we're here today to talk about inflation, and so let me share my screen and uh, the um, starting slide is one of the things that I miss the most about Reed, which is the view out of my office window in Volum, uh, <clears throat> and this was on a particularly snowy February day a few years back. Uh, when I, I came into the office early in the morning and looked out the window and it was just like a fairyland out there. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is um, so just some things about what's going on with inflation right now, uh, both in the United States and abroad, though I'm going to focus on, on the United States. And I'm not going to make any predictions because economists are terrible at that. And uh, I, if this is being recorded and people can play it back, I don't want anybody to play it back a year from now and see how ridiculous my predictions would end up being. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, what I'd like to do, the focus I'd like to have is uh, very much like what we do in read classes. I, I want to help you understand how to interpret what's going on right now and how economists interpret what's going on right now. And uh, you may agree with our interpretation or you may not, but at least you have you will have some understanding uh, of how economists think about these these issues. So this was a headline I picked up three hours ago from the Washington Post website, uh, and it, it very much reflects the uh, concerns that people have right now and the occasionally sensational um, headlines that you see. Uh, and we'll see that that 7.5% is maybe not something that we should be as worried about as the, uh, um, as the headlines would suggest. Um, I want to start with some very basic concepts about how economists define inflation and how we think about um, inflation. And the first thing um, <clears throat> we want to think about is the difference between relative prices and the general price level. And what we mean by relative prices is the price of one good in terms of other goods. So um, our, is asparagus more expensive than Brussels sprouts uh, per pound? 
to use my favorite classroom examples. I love asparagus and my students, uh, it, it started to become a joke in my classes because every time I needed a, a, a good to be an example, it was always asparagus. Um, <clears throat> but relative prices are not what we're talking about with inflation. Relative prices are really important. Relative prices do the most of the work in a market economy to uh, allocate resources among alternative uses. Uh, if a good becomes more scarce, it, like um, used cars, for example, that will lead to a higher price relative to everything else. And that'll do several things. First of all, consumers will find substitutes for it. Um, you know, I'm getting ready to think about buying a new car, but I'm certainly not going to do it right now because my old cars will go along a little bit longer and, and uh, uh, I'm going to wait until the, the relative price of cars has, has uh, gone back down to where it normally is. Um, it also means that the uh, only the highest value uh, buyers remain in the market. So for example, I I'm not a really high value buyer for cars because I have a perfectly serviceable car that I can continue to use. Uh, if I were desperate, like my son, whose car was totaled uh, about uh, uh, eight months ago, uh, he was desperate. He had he had to buy a car. And so he was in the market and, and he bought a car. Um, <clears throat> the allocation of resources, uh, one, of, one of the basic tenets of, of economics is that uh, allocation of resources in order to be efficient requires that relative prices be very flexible. And if we have a policy such as uh, arbitrary wage price controls that uh, inhibit the relative price changes, then that leads to shortages and surpluses in the economy and inefficiencies of various kinds. Um, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking fundamentally about relative prices. We're talking about inflation or deflation, which is negative inflation. Um, is a, it's a change in the general aggregate price level, the price of everything. And that amounts to being a change in the value of money vis-a-vis -vis goods and services. And so that's, that's really what we're talking about today. Um, <clears throat> So how do we measure this? And I'm not gonna go into any details here because you all know the terms and, and I'm just gonna try to hit a couple of points. Um, inflation is the year to year percentage change in a price index. And the way that we're measuring this now is usually this month versus one year ago this month. Uh, and that means that if something weird happened last February, that's gonna be the basis of our comparison with this year. So for example, if last February, because the pandemic was raging, uh, prices were relatively depressed and we look at prices now, that's gonna increase the inflation rate just because we're comparing it to an artificially low number. So that's one thing to think about in terms of the measurement of inflation. <clears throat> we have two um, common price indexes. There are a lot of price indexes, but there are two that sometimes make the news. One that was the one that was used in the Washington Post headline this morning is the Consumer Price Index. And those are all in capitals because this is an official title of a price index as opposed or in addition to being a description. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics and that index estimates the change in prices now versus some base year of a historical consumption bundle which means we're using the stuff that we bought years ago, maybe as many as 10 years ago, and asking how much does that cost now versus how much it cost last year. Um, <clears throat> that consumption bundle tends to be pretty out of date. And as a result, the consumer price index is viewed as less accurate than the alternatives, which is why only the newspapers uh, really use it. Economists don't use it very often. The second common one is the Consumer Expenditures Price Index, the so-called PCE for Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. And this is collected by the Bureau of Economic Analysis as part of their uh, national income and product accounts. And the, the main difference here, other than broader coverage in the PCE index, is that it uses the current consumption bundle. It uses what we're consuming right now as opposed to what we consume 10 or 
five, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and that makes it a little bit more accurate. <clears throat> you also hear about the core PCE index. And that's the same index, but it strips out the prices of food and energy, which tend to be very volatile. Uh, and so it really is looking at sort of the core of the economy. Uh, when, and that's what the Federal Reserve emphasizes when it's looking at monetary policy. Now, granted, the Fed looks at everything. They have obviously vast databases and they have a, a huge team of economists to analyze all the numbers. But the one number that they pay, to which they pay the most attention uh, on inflation is the core PCE index. Now these indexes, especially the consumer price index, tend to overstate inflation. And there are a number of reasons for that. And I can talk a little bit about them, but basically it doesn't pick up improvements in product quality, for example. If uh, something, you know, if, if a new car is, uh, is better than an old car and sells for more, it's gonna pick that up as inflation rather than as getting a better car. Uh, <clears throat> There are several other reasons. Uh, and the fact that it uses historical consumption bundles is one of the reasons why the CPI in particular uh, tends to overstate inflation. Now, that said, your inflation rate depends entirely on what you consume. So just as a couple of examples, my personal rate of inflation wouldn't involve housing because I've paid off my house, right? I'm not renting, I'm not making house payments. Nothing about that affects my personal cost of living. Similarly, I don't eat meat. And so any increase in the price of meat is totally irrelevant to me. And so, you know, you have to, in order to figure out how much your cost of living goes up, you'd have to do some research, dig into the sub aggregate numbers and try to figure out what the, uh, you know, what, where, where, well, how much your cost of living has gone up. So <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about three kinds of price changes. Uh, there can be temporary price changes or temporary increases in aggregate prices, one-time permanent price increases, and then there's the ongoing steady state inflation. And that's the one that we should be kind of worried about. So let me, I've, I've got some, some simple diagrams here. You know that economists can't get by without diagrams. I don't have a blackboard here. So here, here are my diagrams. Whoops. <clears throat> the first one is a one-time temporary price increase. And if you, can you see my cursor? Yeah? Uh, okay. So the price level's in green, the inflation rate's in, in orange. And the price level, we're assuming that it start, it's, it's stable to start with. And then you would have some kind of temporary shock, like a temporary increase in the price of imported oil. Uh, that raises costs and inflation, the, the equilibrium price level jumps up to something like that while oil prices are high. Now the actual price level in the economy adjusts slowly to that sort of equilibrium level. And then <clears throat> oil prices go back down because this was a temporary shock, which means that the equilibrium price level drops back down here and the inflation the gradually the actual price level comes back and what happens is that inflation jumps up and is positive and then it actually is negative during this part of the cycle and then it returns to zero in the long run and so that's that's the temporary uh uh shock um <clears throat> And so that's not what we mean by, usually mean by worrying about inflation. <clears throat> Secondly, maybe oil prices stay high forever. And so you have a permanently higher level of costs for firms and you have a permanently higher price level. Well, <clears throat> once again, actual prices are gonna adjust slowly. That's the dotted line here. And inflation's gonna jump up and then it's going to gradually come back down. And once we reach this new steady state equilibrium up here, our inflation rate is going to be back down to zero. So a permanent shock like that, as long as it's not a permanent rising every year, uh, <clears throat> doesn't lead to ongoing inflation. It leads to a surge of inflation that goes away. And then we're back to zero inflation. <clears throat> the third kind of change is ongoing inflation. <clears throat> And that's a situation where we have inflation, it's bigger than zero, the axis would be down here someplace, and the price level just continues to go up. 
And that positive slope of the prices is, is, indicates the positive inflation rate. Um, <clears throat> steady state inflation is the kind that we had from say 1965 into the 1980s, where inflation is high and continuous and uh, absent some shock that ends it is just going to go on forever. <clears throat> this kind of inflation is costly. Uh, one cost is wealth transfers because people who are holding money or other kinds of assets that are denominated in dollars gradually see the, the uh, value of those assets go away. <clears throat> uh, people will avoid holding money and similar assets, which is inefficient in, an, in and of itself. And particularly, high inflation historically has always been highly variable inflation. And if you have highly variable inflation, um, that means that people become reluctant to sign long-term contracts because you don't know what kind of a price you should charge for something 10 years from now because you don't know if inflation is going to be 5% a year or 2% a year or 10% a year. Um, so that's the really pernicious kind of inflation and that's the kind of inflation that we're all hoping uh, that we don't have uh, in this particular situation. Whoops. So just a couple of historical diagrams. Um, this is the PCE price index, the GDP personal consumption. Um, and this is the one excluding food and energy. Uh, so this is the core PCEs that the Federal Reserve is looking at. And you can see that we've had several spells of inflation over the course of our history, right? <clears throat> The first one I want to point out was in 1947, where we had a spike of inflation up to eight and a half percent. And that was the readjustment after World War II, uh, getting back to a, to a peacetime economy, uh, moving all those resources out of the military and back into the, uh, into the economy. Um, I have to say, I wasn't born yet at that time. Some of you may have been. Uh, I doubt that very many of you were, be, would, were old enough to remember it, though. Um, and notice that this was a one-time spike, and then we had uh, zero inflation, which is really kind of like deflation, uh, the next year. And um, I should mention that because the price indexes usually overstate inflation, um, that's why the Fed generally targets wanting the inflation rate to be about 2%, not zero. And so that's the 0% uh, inflation rate really is actually falling prices. You see another short spike around the Korean War, and then you see the 60s and 70s, when inflation just continued to accelerate upward. We had steady ongoing inflation. We also had highly variable inflation. Uh, Paul Volcker as Fed chair killed this off in the early 80s. And you can see that ever since then we have not had much problem and even the current upward blip in inflation doesn't look too much like something we should panic about. Granted, this ends in um, <clears throat> this particular chart ends in 2000, so I guess we can't really say anything about the current uh, um, current situation. <clears throat> this second diagram is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's what they call an underlying inflation gauge, and this is looking at trying to, to strip out factors that are kind of one-time blips. <clears throat> and what you see here, the, the brown line here is CPI inflation. You can see that that's about 7.5%, which is really, really high. Uh, <clears throat> the blue line is the one that we really ought to be worried about, which is the their uh, full measure of underlying inflation in the economy once you strip out these obviously transitory and seasonal things. And you can see that's running about four and a half percent. That's bigger than it has been since uh, 2000, but um, it's not seven and a half. And so that suggests that the seven and a half is, is probably not something that we're quite needing to worry that much about uh, at, at that level. So let's talk about a little bit of basic theory. How do economists try to explain inflation. And uh, you, you all know the, the, the story about the uh, parrot that was taught to give economic advice 
And anytime anybody asked him a question about uh, what's going to happen and what, what, what's, the, what's the answer, he, he just parroted supply and demand. Uh, so this is the, the, the macroeconomic version of that argument that it all depends on aggregate demand and aggregate supply. <clears throat> um, and by aggregate demand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking three lectures in the macro class and, and giving it to you in 30 seconds. <clears throat> it's basically how much goods and services produced by Americans people want to buy at current prices and people include consumers it includes businesses building new factories and the like it includes governments and uh foreigners although it subtracts out what we buy from foreigners so that's <clears throat> that's what we mean by aggregate demand and in times when desired spending is really high aggregate demand is really high aggregate supply is simply how much american producers producers of american goods and services uh, want to make and sell at current prices. <clears throat> if aggregate demand is greater than aggregate supply at current prices, then current prices will tend to rise, and that means we'll have inflation. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the pandemic economy. What's going on? And <clears throat> first of all, on the aggregate demand side, aggregate demand is very high. Um, there are several reasons for this. One is the stimulus spending uh, that has happened during the pandemic. Uh, our government has been very generous uh, with uh, giving money to people. And as a result, people have been able to spend. And uh, the, the in aggregate level of aggregate demand has been correspondingly very high. We're now starting to see the, the first spending associated with the infrastructure bill that was passed uh, at the beginning of the year, and that will continue for the next uh, however many years. Um, one that you might not have thought of is that uh, we baby boomers are just transitioning from a period of our lives where our incomes were at their highest right before retirement, and our saving is at its highest, right, to a period after retirement where our incomes are essential, our labor income is essentially zero, and we are dissaving, we are drawing on those, the saving that we have made for all of our life. <clears throat> and this means instead of being high consumers, we are high savers. And that's a subtraction from, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it's actually an increase in consumption because we're no longer saving. Uh, we are now consuming uh, rather than saving our, our income. So our consumption has gone up relative to our income. And finally, monetary policy. The, the Fed, in the, the financial crisis of 2008-2010, what the Fed did was essential to saving the economy, essentially. And they undertook an unprecedented expansionary monetary policy. They were very slow to unwind that because the recession of 2008 to 10 was very slow in going away. And just about the time they were starting to unwind this very stimulative monetary policy, the pandemic comes along. And they decided they needed more expansion. That was not as much of a cut and dried uh, slam dunk case as the case was in uh, 2008 to 2010. But nonetheless, <clears throat> um, they have continued to expand. Aggregate demand for all of these reasons is very high. On the supply side, on the other hand, we have constraints of various kinds. <clears throat> First of all, the hospitality sector is probably the best example, but a number of sectors of the economy basically froze up and had a, a couldn't produce and so you know when you can't produce that obviously is a decline in aggregate supply secondly um the shortages of certain critical things would lead to a fall in the production of the industries that use those things as inputs and computer chips is probably the best example of that where we can't make cars because we can't get uh, semiconductor chips 
Uh, and that leads us into the issue of supply chains. And supply chains, as we all hear every day on the news, are messed up. Uh, I have a diagram that I'll show you that, that is an index um, from, again, the New York Fed about supply chain constraints. <clears throat> and the problem is that it takes firms years, not months, years, to resource their inputs, to uh, figure out how to cope with these supply chain issues, to onshore production process, that they have to build more factories. That takes a long time. And the result is that these supply chain things, far from being you know, a, a few months, it's gonna take a few years to sort everything out. This is the supply chain pressure index. And you can see that since 1997, which is as far as they went back with it, it's been pretty stable. Occasionally, one standard deviation or one and a half standard deviations above or below the uh, uh, the mean, and then all of a sudden the pandemic comes along and we are almost five standard deviations above in terms of supply chain, supply chain constraints. And so <clears throat> clearly, you know, this is a problem and it's not a problem that's going to go away right away. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm out of practice. I haven't lectured for a year and a half. <clears throat> Another factor on the supply side is wages and labor markets. And it's very well established that the uh, increase in uh, income disparity between the well-educated wealthy class and the less educated lower class uh, had grown dramatically since the 1980s. And as a result, you know, these things don't last forever. It's time for the wage gap to again <clears throat> reestablish an equilibrium toward a more um, typical historical level. And so I, before the pandemic, I expected the real wages of less educated workers to rise. Uh, and indeed, that is happening. It's happening, uh, it, it, it seemed to need something to kind of spur it to happen. And the something that, that spurred it was reorganization of labor due to the pandemic, people working from home, furloughs in the service sector, reorganizing the factory floor so that you have social distance and, and et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the great resignation that you hear so much about, a um, number of people decided that they didn't want to go back to the old job that they from which they had been furloughed. Labor shortages. Uh, we're in a situation now where the number of recorded vacancies is larger than the number of unemployed workers, which <clears throat> basically has never ha been happening since the time they collected the, started collecting the data in the 1990s. Um, some of us older workers opted for retirement, although I have to say I had that plan before the pandemic came along. <clears throat> So when we have labor shortages, that is what stimulates wage increases. And when we have wage increases, that raises costs for firms, and that also pushes aggregate supply back because firms can't afford to produce as much at the current price level and leads to increasing prices. <clears throat> so those are the reasons that I think that inflation has risen in the last year. Now, what about the future? And I'm not gonna predict, because I know I'll be wrong, <clears throat> but I wanna talk about how I will think about forming my expectations about future inflation. <clears throat> First, we th need to think about what kind of price change this is with the pandemic. Is this a temporary one-time rise, a permanent ri price rise, or is this ongoing inflation with an extra comma at the end? because I changed the order of these things. <clears throat> um, let's think about the shocks we've been talking about. Monetary and fiscal policies. Are these temporary, permanent, or ongoing? Well, we can probably rule out ongoing because I don't think that the, the government is gonna continue to raise spending uh, over time. <clears throat> I would expect that most of them will be temporary because we're starting to see the Fed talking about tightening monetary policy. We're starting to see the um, fiscal policy start to, to move back toward uh, some kind of balance. Supply chain difficulties, 
Um, as I argued a couple of slides back, I think that's going to take some time, but I also think that's likely to be a temporary uh, situation. <clears throat> Labor supply reorganization is more difficult to tell, but again, uh, one would expect we would approach some kind of equilibrium with uh, a different kind of labor uh, labor utilization, but nonetheless a stable labor utilization where firms will have adjusted and workers will have adjusted. Um, and we can't predict what other supply and demand shocks may come along. Uh, so that's kind of a waffle at that point. But in terms of the kinds of price changes that we're seeing right now, most of them seem to me to be more or less uh, temporary or one time. <clears throat> So what could lead us into a prolonged inflation? Well, if we had continued policy stimulus, that we continued to have high fiscal spending and low taxes without ever moving back towards some kind of balance, if the Fed continued to pursue a stimulative policy long past when the economy has recovered. Uh, <clears throat> so that would be something that would prolong the inflationary uh, process. <clears throat> repeated adverse supply shocks. I expect that today's supply chain problems and trade disruptions will be resolved, but who knows what's going to happen next? <clears throat> and it's entirely possible, for example, that climate change leads to some very costly adaptations that may raise firms' costs dramatically and could be a negative supply shock to the economy. <clears throat> the worst thing that we would worry about is the onset of what we call an inflationary spiral. And <clears throat> we have wages that rise because of a higher cost of living. That raises firms' costs and they have to raise prices. And that raises the cost of living, which means that workers are going to bargain for a higher wage. And that sort of spiral is what happened in the 70s and 80s. And that depends crucially on expectations about inflation. What do people expect from inflation? Are they going to plan this in to their wage bargaining? Um, and so let's take a look at a couple of measures of inflation ex expectations. This is short run consumer inflation expectations. Um, this is a one year horizon. So this is what consumers expect to happen between now and a year from now, collected by the University of Michigan Survey Research Center. And you can see that we had very high inflation expectations on the order of 10% uh, in 1980. <clears throat> We've had some wiggling and wobbling since then, um, but now we have a significant rise over the last year in inflation expectations. And the one year expected inflation rate <clears throat> as of December is 4.8%. This is a 10 year ahead expected inflation rate. What do we expect to happen over the next 10 years? And instead of being consumers, this is professional forecasters. <clears throat> and the median is the red line and the interquartile range is the gray. And you can see that over 10 years, professional forecasters expect as of the fourth quarter of 2021, somewhere between two and two and a half percent over 10 years. And so high inflation in the immediate future, lower inflation over a longer time horizon. So let's talk just for a minute, and I'm, I know I'm over time and I'm, I'm gonna try to wrap it up fairly quickly, but <clears throat> most of us are retirees. And so let's talk for a little bit about what inflation means for retired people. Um, <clears throat> Basics of pensions, um, defined benefit pension plans, the company promises to pay you a certain amount uh, for the rest of your life uh, after retirement, and these benefits may or may not be indexed to inflation. It just depends on the company. Uh, if they're not indexed to inflation, if you get a certain number of dollars every year for the rest of your life, inflation is going to eat into that and reduce the real value of your retirement benefits over time. Social security is indexed to inflation. Uh, it's backward looking, which means it catches up to last year's inflation, not that it uh, you know, uh, compensates for this year's inflation, because we don't know this year's inflation yet. Um, 
many of you and I uh, are on defined contribution saving plans, and that's where your employer and you invest in assets like a 401k that um, depending on how your asset portfolio does, you may do very well inflation or you may end up doing very badly inflation. So we need to talk about what kind of assets might be beneficial and how inflation affects assets. <clears throat> the real return on your assets, which is the return that you get on your assets in terms of what you can buy with them, as opposed to how many dollars they're worth, is the nominal dollar return minus the inflation rate. If we anticipate inflation, then typically nominal interest rates rise up with the expected rate of inflation in such a way as the, to keep the real rate of return, the difference between them, positive. Unanticipated inflation, which is what we're having now, because none of us expected two years ago that we were going to have this sudden surge of inflation, uh, that can drive the real return negative if the nominal rate is stuck and the inflation rate jumps above it. So that's what's happening to any of you who have savings accounts that pay one tenth of one percent uh, right now <clears throat> when the inflation rate is is five percent. Um, <clears throat> one alternative, whoops, sorry, let me go back. One alternative <clears throat> is to invest in what we call real assets. And these are things uh, like houses and cars and gold. Uh, and the price of these things usually goes up with inflation because inflation is the increase in the price of things. And so that's a safe asset from the standpoint of not losing its value to inflation. It may or may not give you a good return, right? Your car is not getting any more valuable in real terms sitting in your driveway as an investment asset, unless you have a very unusual car, <clears throat> but it also is probably going up with inflation uh, in, in, in some sense. Um, the worst thing, bank accounts and low interest bonds. These typically have negative real returns for reasons that we've talked about. Um, <clears throat> what about stocks? <sighs> what about stocks? Um, in theory, stock prices should go up with inflation because the stuff that companies are selling that generate profits are going up in dollar value. And so the dollar value of a share in those companies should go up. But historically, that hasn't always been the case. And that's why uh, I splurged on the question marks here, because I, I really can't tell you in good conscience that stocks are going to be a good hedge against inflation. But in principle, I think they should be. So what's the bottom line? Well, first of all, economists' forecasts are always wrong. And you know that's the case. And so don't trust anything I really say uh, <clears throat> in terms of what's going to happen in the, in the real world. But based on the data that we have as of right now, it looks like we're going to have relatively high inflation for a year or two years, something like that. And that over three to five years, certainly over 10 years, we expect inflation to get back to a more normal inflation rate of around 2%, possibly a little bit higher than that. And that means some discomfort, but not the kind of ruinous inflation that uh, Nazi or that pre-Nazi Germany had in, in the 1920s, or that um, even the kind of inflation that we had in the 1970s. So with that, I will stop talking and see if any of you have questions uh, that I can um, attempt to answer. So I need to Thank find you. Some. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. There we go. <laughs> um, so I'll start with what was put into the chat. Um, so the first question I think was when you were talking about our personal inflation, like personal choices, what about property tax? Property tax is a tough one because the question is, is that part of inflation or not? And typically the price indexes that we use for inflation do not include property tax. They include sales tax because they try to measure what you pay for a particular good or service as the value that that good or service has to you. And so an increase in sales tax means, you know, instead of um, being 
worth a dollar and five cents to you with a five cent, uh, five percent sales tax. It's worth a dollar and eight cents with an eight percent. And so those are included in our price indexes and in inflation, but not the uh, uh, not property taxes. So that's a that's a good point. And you you know if you're building your personal uh, price index, you you know I would certainly want to build that in. <clears throat> The next question was about, um, let's see here, is inflation uh, a rate or an absolute number? Inflation is a percentage rate. It is a an, an annual rate, which means that we measure it over the period of a year. Uh, so when we say inflation is 5%, we're not saying prices are 5% higher than they were last month. We're saying that prices are 5% higher than they were a year ago this month. Uh, and so it is indeed a rate, uh, and it's comparable to, for example, interest rates and the growth rate of the economy and these kinds of things. These are all expressed as annual rates. Thank you. Um, the next is uh, R.B. Reich uh, says that monopoly or collusion pricing is a big driver of current inflation. Do you agree? I think this is really important. And I think that, you know, the issue of antitrust is going to be one of the big issues that we're going to have to address in economic policy over the next five to 10 years. Whether it's a huge driver of inflation, in order for it to be a huge driver of inflation, one would have to say that it is much worse than it was, say, three or four years ago. Uh, because why would it be raising prices now by more than it raised price, prices uh, a few years ago? Um, and, you know, maybe in some cases it is. The other thing that is worth thinking about is that the places that we are seemingly most concerned about monopoly is goods and services we don't pay for, like Google and Facebook, right? And we pay for them implicitly through advertising, but it's not like they've raised their prices a lot in order to restrain their monopoly positions. Uh, it's not like they've, they've prevented entry by some other uh, social media firm that is going to provide their services at lower cost, um, considering that they're not charging anything. And so uh, that's, that's a couple of reasons why one might be skeptical about whether that's really at the heart of uh, today's inflation. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, isn't climate change adjustment a pretty sure thing? And also uh, with conflict with China, attempts to adjust the supply chain? Both of the very good, very good comments. Both of those are definitely true. <clears throat> what is not clear is the economic impact of these things. I mean, there, there are going to be adjustments to climate change, but um, it's very hard to know, and I certainly don't know, how much that's going to raise firms' costs over what time horizon and how much that's going to contribute to inflation. And similarly, conflict with China, yes, we're having to reorganize our supply chains. That's going to be costly. We're, we're importing from China for a reason, uh, because it's cheap, because it's efficient, because it allows us to, to sell goods and services at a lower price and, and uh, sell more of them, and uh, as a result, make more money. And that's why firms have uh, offshored their supply chains. And that would be, uh, you know, that, that would be, uh, it's, it's hard to predict how much, the, how much costs will rise and how firms will, will uh, respond to that in terms of uh, having to reduce their dependence on, on Chinese imports. Uh, the next question, is there a relationship between inflation and international trade deficit? Uh, it's complicated. <clears throat> um, the <clears throat> in, first of all, right now, inflation is really pretty much a worldwide phenomenon among the, the large major trading economies. And so our prices aren't rising notably faster than say the EU's prices or Japan's price, well, the Japan's prices maybe, uh, or China's prices. <clears throat> the second thing is that the exchange rate acts as a buffer between these. Uh, 
And so if the value of the dollar goes up or down, that's like our prices going up or down. And so you would have to look not just at US inflation, but also at foreign inflation and at the um, exchange rate between the US and any given foreign economy in order to really get a feel for whether our competitiveness is enhanced or, or uh, hurt by, by the current situation. And I haven't done the numbers on those. I'm sorry, I can't, uh, can't really speak to that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is maybe related to the question about um, China, et cetera, but what about if we end up in, a, in war in Ukraine? Uh, what might that mean for the economy? It depends on what you mean by war in, in Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> if we end up sending thousands of troops, um, that's going to be, you know, that that would be, and I don't think that's going to happen, but that would be a serious impact. Um, <clears throat> if, you know, it, it's, I think that realistically, the effect on real economic activity is likely to be small. The effect on financial assets may be much larger. So it might be that the stock market is quite sensitive to that. The stock market is always very sensitive to headlines. Uh, but I, it, in terms of U.S. production, we are really not that. Uh, Ukraine is a tiny part of our of our imports and exports. Russia is even a relatively small part of our imports and exports. <clears throat> that said, the EU is obviously a lot more vulnerable because they have some very crucial uh, imports, namely oil and gas, from Russia that will be very hard to substitute in the short run. And so that would be where I would look for major effects of uh, a possible escalation of, of conflict in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, can the Fed offset continued uh, stimulative fiscal policy? So how effective is Fed action in keeping inflation under control? Well, if you believe um, Milton Friedman, and I kind of believe Milton Friedman, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the Fed is crucial. Uh, you know, the Fed is everything. <clears throat> I think we've pretty much figured out that the Fed isn't everything uh, with respect to inflation, but that doesn't mean that the Fed isn't important with respect to inflation. Uh, Friedman used to argue, and, and uh, half the economics profession uh, used to argue that, that basically, <clears throat> Um, you look at the growth in the money supply, and that's going to drive inflation. Well, starting in 2008, that relationship totally broke down. And to the extent that there was a relationship before, which seems to be very clear in extreme cases. So Venezuela has extremely high inflation because it has extremely high money, monetary growth. And you know there the connection is obvious. But <clears throat> until you get to the you know 100% inflation rate, the connection is very, very noisy. <clears throat> and it got a whole lot noisier because of structural changes in what money is and in how the Federal Reserve operates after 2008. And so <clears throat> You know, the answer is yes, the Fed can slow down the economy. If you believe what they say in their minutes, they're going to slow down the economy, or at least they're going to try to slow down the economy. Uh, interest rates are going to go up. <clears throat> Monetary expansion is, not, is, going to, is going to slow down and eventually stop. Uh, <clears throat> whether this is likely to offset the effects of fiscal policy is unclear. Um, because it's unclear how much the Fed will raise interest rates. Um, it, my guess is that the Fed continues to be, although it's going to start tightening, it's going to continue to be in a generally positive stimulative position for at least a year. And so the Fed's not going to, going to slow things down right away. But that's just my guess. You know, it's worth what you paid for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, what if taxes were indexed by inflation? So the example is, I bought a house for $216,000 in 1897. 
30 years later, I sold it for a million. So that partly might reflect inflation and partly what happened to Bay Area house prices. Very, very good question. <clears throat> one, since I bought my house for 91,000 in, uh, in 1988, it's one that I think about a lot. Um, <clears throat> the, the current tax code for capital gains is not indexed. And the result is that some people end up with a potentially very high tax bill for nominal dollar gains that are not real gains, that are just increases in the price level. Now, <clears throat> the, the government tries to sort of compensate for that with various fudges. Uh, one is that they have a lower tax rate applied to capital gains, which because you're paying a lower tax rate on that capital gain, uh, that offsets some of the overstating of the capital gain itself due to inflation. <clears throat> Um, another one is, and I don't know if this is still in effect, I should know if this is still in effect, is that at one time you were allowed to one time in your life wipe out the capital gains on a house that you live in. And so, <clears throat> you know, for those of us who only are going to have one capital gain on a house in our lives, that was a really good policy. Uh, so they, the, the government, it's, indexing is complicated. And the government tries to, you know, do other things to, to accomplish kind of sort of the same thing without trying to get into the details of writing a complicated indexation formula. So, yes, that is a problem. And it is a problem with the current inflation as well. <clears throat> so, um, if uh, Jeff, if you're good, I'll, I still have a few more questions coming in. Um, sure. <laughs> Can inflation be offset by increases in productivity and are any anticipated? Excellent question. Increases in productivity are positive supply shocks as opposed to the adverse supply shocks. <clears throat> so if we have an increase in productivity and that's why wages are rising, that should not be inflationary because people are getting more, uh, the, the, their costs are going up of a unit of labor, but the cost of a unit of producing output is not going up because each of those units of labor is producing more. And so that's an excellent question. It's not what we focused on today, but it maybe should have. Uh, <clears throat> so we would predict that improvements in productivity should lower inflation, given the other factors associated with aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And as to whether we expect those, um, I'm an optimist. I always expect those. Um, the data suggests that I'm often overly optimistic and that uh, productivity doesn't increase as fast as some of us think we should, uh, the, the, the think, think that it should be increasing. Uh, <clears throat> there's a famous uh, story that's uh, attributed to uh, Robert Solow, who was one of the, the uh, early giants of, of economic growth theory and uh, and the theory of productivity measurement that uh, uh, in the 1990s, he, he is asserted to have said, uh, computers are everywhere except in the productivity statistics. That, you know, we were, we, we all thought that computers should be making us so much more productive and the data just didn't show it. Uh, the data showed a slowdown in productivity growth starting in the mid eighties. And so that led uh, economists on, on wild goose chases, maybe not wild goose chases, but long, chases uh, to try to figure out um, why wasn't why wasn't why it was measured productivity growth not increasing were we mismeasuring it for example and there's you know probably were but uh i'm what about I'm, robotics professor parker yes well <clears throat> robotics would be one area where uh, again <clears throat> labor productivity would go up. Now, what you're doing in robotics is substituting capital for labor. And so if we think about a more comprehensive notion of productivity beyond labor productivity, what we call total factor productivity, product, how much we get for each unit of all of the capital and labor inputs that we use. Um, I assume that a substitution of robots for workers probably increases total factor productivity, but otherwise they wouldn't do it. 
but it's, you know, you have one input going up and one input going down. And so it's not totally obvious that the increased output is necessarily uh, an increase in total factor productivity, but it probably is. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we're just about at four o'clock. Do you want to take one final question? How about one final question? <clears throat> okay. Um, to what extent does foreign capital investment in US markets, uh, for example, real estate, contribute to domestic supply shortages? Well, that's a good question. Um, real estate is a is a very hard example to analyze because um, the uh, real estate is, is existing houses and land are not counted in gross domestic product. We don't count that in GDP because it's not being produced. Right. And so if we have a rise in the price of that, that's good for the person that owns it and bad for the person that buys it. And so it's kind of washes out when we talk about the aggregate um, uh, production. And so it's not that it isn't not that those things aren't important. Uh, they're just not included in our typical measures of inflation. Now, as for foreign investment in productive capital, uh, plant and equipment for firms, that should increase US productivity. It should be a, a beneficial supply shock and allow us to produce more goods in the United States at, a, at any given price level. So that should be moderating with respect to inflation. But again, that's just in theory and how much it actually happens, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for your presentation and for uh, answering so many questions um, that came forward uh, from your lecture. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, and just a couple of reminders um, that the Foster Schultz Club Steering Committee uh, is planning for additional speakers uh, in March and April. And then uh, please don't forget about reunions in June as well. Um, so more information will be sent out, posted to the Reed website about that. Um, I also plan to make this recording available uh, on the Reed remote webpage as soon as possible so that that can be shared. Uh, or, or if you want to watch again, you can. Uh, and with that, um, I just thank you so much for being here. Uh, Professor if, if, Parker, thank you. If you want to send an email with a question, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, I'm retired now. I don't have to prep for class <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, it's just parker at reed.edu. <clears throat> thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.